is going to be 23.2. We're continue our, continuing our look at the Cold War, the Truman administration, and the rise of McCarthyism during this time. So we're going to start with a quote from Edward R. Murrow, who is the host of See It Now uh, during the 1950s, one of the more popular news shows. Uh, and uh, at the end of one of his uh, shows focusing on Joseph McCarthy, he said, we must not confuse dissent with disloyalty. So let's start with the fair deal in... Let's see how many times I can say the word communist in the next 30 minutes. So, shortly after the end of World War II, the uh, U.S. reverted from being a country that was focusing on uh, producing wartime material to one that was focused on producing peacetime and industrial and uh, commercial goods. So, our standing army suddenly dropped from 12 million people to 3 million people very quickly. Most of these guys, uh, and most of them were men, very quickly returned to the workforce. Now, part of this included getting uh, rid of two million working women during this time who had taken their place. Uh, some, however, did go to school thanks to the GI Bill and took a little time getting their education after the war. Uh, the U.S. also did abolish wartime restrictions on industrial production and price controls, meaning that uh, the amount of stuff that was being produced was going way up. It was shooting up during this time. Unfortunately, so were the prices for all that stuff. Uh, also, men and women were having lots and lots and lots of babies. Baby booms started about nine months after World War II. Now, President Truman, who had been a New Dealer, tried to revive a lot of FDR's sort of Depression-era New Deal reforms after the war. Uh, he called his the Fair Deal, starting in about September 1945. Truman wanted to do things like improve the social safety net, raise the standard of living, increase minimum wage, go for national health insurance, uh, create an expansion for public housing, um, get more social security going, and fund better education as well. Uh, to his critics, they basically said, this guy is more Roosevelt than Roosevelt. Uh, he's more FDR than FDR. He's going further with his fair deal than Roosevelt ever did in his new deal. So the end of the war also led labor unions to call for better wages during this time, and they improved working conditions. Um, that had been something that uh, had been stopped during the war. Basically, much like World War I, labor unions had more or less agreed that we're not going to mess with the war effort by, you know, striking or anything right now or asking for wage increases. However, once the war is over, so is that deal. So the AFL and the CIO, two of the major groups of unions, created what was called Operation Dixie in 1946 with the idea that they wanted to unionize Southern workers who had, for the most part, stayed out of union jobs. And also, uh, you know, it's not just industrial workers. They're going for farm workers now, too. Uh, with this war at an end, workers saw their hours dropping and the price of goods going up, and so they thought now is a great time to unionize to try to make sure that we can keep affording this post-war life. Now, in response to all this, over 5 million workers uh, from a variety of jobs went on strike due to the economic unease. Uh, this included auto workers, miners, steel manufacturers, and even workers at Hollywood Studios. Uh, Truman, however, was very worried that these strikes could hurt the post-war economy, and so as progressive as he was and as much of a new dealer as he was, he actually went against the labor unions at this moment, and when the railroad workers went on strike, he basically said, guess what? Mail goes on the railroads, so I can federalize them if I want to. Uh, he said that he would take federal control of the railways and put every striking worker into the army, which is, that's a move right there. Um, he also used the courts to get the workers back on the job, basically. So uh, while he may have been, in general, pro-union and uh, pro-progressive movements, uh, he also would not do anything that would impact the uh, economic recovery, especially right after the war, when people were worried that we might just slip back into a depression. Now, to try to satisfy the unions, Truman also did sort of throw them a bone, which is that he sent uh, he created a fact-finding board to investigate what was going wrong, and the board generally recommended that they should raise their wages, which helped them at least try to keep up with inflation. So here is uh, Truman with his crown of inherent powers. Harry I is what they're calling him here, which reminds me of the King Andrew I uh, cartoon that we looked at back in semester one. 
Now, partly inspired by all this labor drama going on, along with all the white men refusing to join these uh, unions that were trying to get both African Americans and white people to join, um, there was a fear of civil rights, uh, the civil rights portion of the New Deal. Um, a lot of the American public pushed back against the Democrats during this time. Um, there was a feeling that Democrats were sort of straying uh, from their post-war high. Um, and so in the 1946 election, the Republicans actually took control of the House and the Senate for the first time in about 20 years. Uh, conservative Southern, Southern Democrats uh, who were still in office were mainly siding with Republicans against Truman. So Truman saw that his popularity was dropping, that his power was decreasing, uh, that um, a more conservative Congress could actually override his vetoes, as a matter of fact. So Congress moved to uh, end, I don't know what guy means there, but we're going with it, uh, moved to end the fair deal, gut, I think is what I meant, to gut the fair deal. There we go. I can translate myself. Um, they voted down most of uh, Harry Truman's initiatives. They also voted to pass a tax cut for the wealthy as a way to spur the economy, which is good for the wealthy, less good for the workers. Um, when Congress passed what's called the Taft-Hartley Act in 1947, Truman actually vetoed it, but Congress was powerful enough at this moment to override the president's veto. So, why was he, what was it and why was he against it? The Taft-Hartley Act reduced the power of labor unions. Uh, it said that the president could stop strikes uh, for an 80-day cooling-off period and also uh, could stop sort of like, well, if you're striking, then we're striking groups. Uh, the act also stopped companies from forcing workers to join unions. This is what's called a closed shop. So there are certain jobs where if you get it, you have to join the labor union in order to get that job. Uh, the Taft-Hartley Act stopped it. Uh, it also allowed states to pass right-to-work laws that prohibited closed shops at the state level. So here is a, a union's anti-Taft-Hartley poster where we see the Taft-Hartley law taking money and union contracts out of a union workers' uh, pockets, but uh, it's, uh, it's, only be it's for your own good, according to Mr. Taft-Hartley there. Now, during his first term, Truman also had reached out to civil rights activists, and uh, they were continuing to call for civil rights reform in the late 40s. Uh, remember, this, is, this was part of his uh, World War II experience, uh, and so many were still coming off the success of the war. Uh, in the late 40s and early 50s, many states were passing uh, anti-discrimination uh, laws uh, related to jobs, uh, they're also promoting access to public resources. Uh, you can guess not a lot of this is going on in the South. But we do see that uh, the NAACP is trying to get into the Deep South and trying to promote uh, equal rights in the Deep South. Uh, the NAACP launched voter drives, and they worked in the Upper South, like Tennessee, uh, you know, Arkansas, Missouri, less so in Mississippi and Alabama. Uh, in 1952, for the first time since we started keeping track 70 years before, there were no reported lynchings in 1952. Now, another area where we see the uh, civil rights movement uh, seeing a bit of success is in sports. So in 1947... Uh, the Brooklyn Dodgers hired uh, Jackie Robinson to be their first baseman. He was the first professional black baseball player in the major leagues since, like, I don't know, the 1880s, basically. Uh, and Jackie Robinson, along with being a very good player, was partially hired because he was somebody who the, the manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers, a guy named Branch Rickey, St. Louis guy, by the way, um, they believed that uh, Jackie Robinson would be able to hold his temper even when being insulted and harassed, sometimes even by people that he was playing against on the field, not just in the crowd. Uh, this success, the success of Jackie Robinson that he had, uh, led to the integration of the MLB, of the Major League Baseball Leagues, uh, and the elimination of the Negro Leagues, which were the old segregated leagues. Uh, many members of this uh, previous league uh, joined Major League teams, including guys like, well, Satchel Paige and Josh Gibson and Cool Papa Bell and some of the best of the uh, best of the best of uh, the old leagues joined the uh, MLB instead. 
So here's Jackie Robinson, 1919 and 1972. Uh, he's from Georgia, but he moved to Pasadena pretty early on in his life. Uh, he was a lieutenant in the U.S. Army during World War II. He was a baseball player and a businessman later in life. Uh, he was actually almost court-martialed while he was in the Army because he refused to move to the back of an Army bus when told uh, to do so. Uh, it was not a segregated bus, and plus he was a lieutenant, and so he did not feel the need. Uh, so along with baseball, he was also a football player, a basketball player, and a uh, star in track and field. Uh, his number is now retired across the Major League Baseball. Now, in April 1947, a commission had that... Truman had established, released the results of their investigation into civil rights, uh, and their conclusions were that civil rights was a problem area for the United States, and they called upon the federal government to abolish segregation, which, oh, that's a tall order. Uh, they called on the American government to ensure equal treatment for all Americans when it came to big issues like housing and education and employment and criminal justice and so on and so forth. And Truman realized that civil rights and equality for all Americans was going to be a big part of his administration, not just because it was the right thing to do, but also because uh, if we are promoting America as the land of the three, I think we mentioned this last class too, uh, we'd better walk that walk pretty well. So we need to be the vision of Cold War freedom. Now, uh, this is a page from To Secure These Rights, where we see uh, that all Americans have four essential rights, the right to safety and security, the right to citizenship, uh, the right to freedom of uh, conscience and expression, and the right to equality and opportunity. Uh, you can actually find this on the Truman uh, Presidential Library online resource. You can read the entire book if you want to. In 1948, Truman moved forward with a very ambitious civil rights plan and proposed it to Congress. Um, this plan that he had, this is kind of part of his fair deal, uh, included things like a federal civil rights commission, uh, an anti-lynching law, an anti-poll tax law, and laws that ensured equal access for all Americans to all job and all education. And that's a tall order for a Democratic president with an opposing Congress. Uh, a few months later, he uh, issued an executive order that desegregated the U.S. Armed Forces. Uh, the goal was to uh, end racial discrimination. Uh, Truman was never a fan of racial discrimination. Uh, and also to uh, invigorate liberal Democrats, including African Americans. Uh, he realized that if he was going to get elected in 1948, uh, African Americans were going to play a big part in it. Uh, and so the 1948 presidential platform on the Democratic ticket was uh, the most progressive it had ever been, including a plank that for the first time said, we're going to work on civil rights. So this move towards civil rights infuriated a lot of Southern Democrats. Um, they were not on board with the civil rights movement. These are very deep South Democrats. And a group of them who were named the Dixiecrats uh, walked out of the 1948 Democratic Convention and created their own uh, party, basically, after this. So the Democrats formed their own called the States' Rights Democratic Party, uh, and they nominated uh, Governor Strom Thurmond of South Carolina as their presidential candidate. Um, despite saying that, you know, they, they, they basically said, you know, I'm not racist, I'm just calling for segregation. Uh, is what Strom Thurmond said. He he did also say that he was pro-individual liberty, that uh, he compared basically desegregation laws to uh, a national government telling state laws what to do. So he's basically calling down the old states' rights argument. Uh, and he was forcing Southern, uh, that he said that Truman was forcing Southern states to follow national laws, uh, negating states' rights, overreaching his power as a president. So here is Strom Thurmond, 1902 to 2003. He hung in there. Uh, he's from South Carolina. He was a state senator. He was the governor of South Carolina and later on became a senator of South Carolina for 48 years. Uh, he was at different times in his career a Democrat, a Republican, and a Dixiecrat. Uh, and he served for over 48 years in the Senate and stayed in the Senate until he was over the age of 100 years old. So he's the only member of the Senate who's ever lasted that long in the Senate, uh, or, or who lasted to that age at least. 
Now, that is on the sort of conservative Democratic side. Uh, that is the Dixiecrats uh, moving out from the conservative Democratic side. On the more liberal Democratic side, we also have a breakaway party uh, that basically felt that Truman was not doing enough. Um, and they broke away to form the Progressive Party, a new Progressive Party, uh, led by a former vice president named Henry Wallace. Now, Wallace was also calling for desegregation. Uh, however, he was calling for it much more loudly than, than Truman was. And so uh, Wallace was actually attacked as he went through the South. Uh, he is calling for international control over nuclear weapons, a better relationship with the USSR, which basically got him branded as a communist, or at least a communist supporter. Um, and this made him a political outcast. Most of the Progressive Party fled back to Truman. Uh, he did not get very many votes in 1948, but we do have four political parties running in 1948. Here's Henry Wallace, who once said, It is no coincidence that the growth of modern tyrants has in every case been heralded by the growth of prejudice. So in 1948, running for president, we've got Wallace. We've got uh, the liberal Democratic votes with Wallace. We've got uh, Strom Thurmond and the Dixiecrats. We've got Harry Truman running for president. However, most people assumed that Harry Truman was going to lose to the Republican candidate, uh, New York Governor Thomas Dewey. Thomas Dewey, however, seemed very unwilling to commit on important issues. He seemed kind of wishy-washy, was not a great persuasive talker, uh, and he acted as if he'd already won, which is always a dangerous thing to do. History will back me up on that, I feel like. It's always dangerous to think, well, I've won, so I don't really have to campaign very hard. Uh, on the other hand, Truman campaigned like his life depended on it. He went hard on the offensive. He traveled all over the country by train. He was, you know, yelling about his opponents. Uh, he called them the do-nothing Congress. He warned that if he wasn't uh, re-elected, the New Deal benefits like Social Security would just vanish during that time. So here is Harry Truman uh, on his campaign train. Uh, he got the nickname Give Him Hell Harry during this tour. Uh, one guy at a, at a stop allegedly yelled, Give Him Hell Harry. And uh, he said, uh, I don't give him hell. I tell him the truth and they think it's hell. So uh, he, he got that nickname from that. So to the surprise of nearly everyone except for maybe him, Harry Truman won pretty decisively on Election Day. Partially, this was due to black voter turnout in the North. Uh, this is the first time that African-American voters have played a large part in, a re in an election campaign since Reconstruction, basically. Now, we do see, however, that Strom Thurmond did win several states in the Deep South, uh, and this is going to be uh, a dangerous sort of warning signal that uh, the civil rights era that's coming up is going to be a hard-fought battle in places like Alabama and Mississippi. Wallace came in a deep fourth. So here is what the uh, map looked like in 1948. You can see that, that Truman actually won a great number of states right there, with Dewey winning second and Thurmond getting uh, 39 electoral votes, mainly in the Deep South. Now, here's a famous shot of Harry Truman holding a newspaper that said that he had just lost when, in fact, he had just won. So the newspaper called that a little early. Now, let's look at anti-communism during this time. Uh, and here's where I'm going to start saying the word communism uh, about 20 times per slide. So the post-war period showed that we were entering a new modern area, era with the Cold War. Um, this was not going to be World War I. We were not going to be the inclusive or, or the exclusive uh, wall-building America that we were after World War I. Uh, our federal government stayed big and powerful. We had a big, powerful military. Um, the fear of the, the USSR led... Uh, from every to everything from you know better public schooling to an interstate highway system, just in case we ever had to fight a a third world war, we needed to get from one side of the country to the other side very quickly. Uh, we also saw a lot of improvements in aircraft, computers, medicines, uh, lots of other products, uh, and a decrease in government openness. So there suddenly there's a lot of secrecy. Remember, this is the time of the FBI and secret files and the CIA performing experiments on uh, Americans who don't know they're being experimented on, uh, and also a decrease in immigration uh, and openness to other uh, people from other countries. And most of all, the containment of communism would be just as big as an issue uh, on the home front as it was overseas. 
So the fear of communism became one of the biggest factors in American culture during the Cold War. So while Americans still expressed, uh, this is uh, according to a poll, uh, they still had high regard for uh, the personal civil liberties of every American. However, they also supported giving up those civil liberties if you were a communist. Um, many people impacted by the anti-communist crackdown were also social outcasts, including people who normally were seen as sort of living outside the normal scope of American life, including Jewish people, uh, immigrants to our country, and gays and lesbians as well. Um, this sort of anti-communist crackdown also labeled more or less anything beyond proud acceptance of American values as unpatriotic. And this became a weapon that could be brandished, that if you spoke out against what was happening in Washington, D.C., you could be branded as unpatriotic or un-American during this time. So there is a very real red menace and a very real red scare going on during this time. So the link between communism and citizenship was made even more visible and more concrete and more real with the passage of the McCarran-Walter Act of 1952. This said that American citizens that were born overseas could be returned to those countries if they refused to testify uh, about subversive activities. Not really saying what subversive meant, too which is always a problem uh, when you leave a, a definition just broad enough to drive whatever you want to through it. Um, you could also be deported if you joined a subversive group, subversive sort of being the code word for communist. Now, the act was passed even after Truman vetoed it. Uh, he had hoped to make immigration more of a loose set of quotas involving things like reuniting families and looking at uh, what groups and what countries needed political asylum. Um, the McCarran-Walter Act kept it more rigid until about 1965. Now, fear of anti-communism was also linked to the fear of immigrants during this time. In 1954, the Eisenhower administration passed a, uh, a law called Operation Wetback, which wetback is a... Uh, a derogatory term, especially for Mexican workers in, in the fields. Uh, and so Operation Wetback had the goal of the U.S. military going into foreign neighborhoods, uh, neighborhoods where a lot of illegal immigrants lived, and arresting them and deporting them. Uh, over one million Mexican immigrants were deported during the 1950s, and here are some of them being driven back to Mexico in a barred truck. Now, this hysteria and paranoia regarding communist invasion during this time really ramped up in about 1947. Um, that was around the time that government workers started to be accused of disloyalty. Uh, you were uh, not free to face your accusers if you were accused, um, and you had to prove your loyalty, which could be very difficult. Um, this program of sort of trying to ferret out disloyal Americans, uh, especially focused on people, like I said, who were outside the normal scope. Uh, the book talks about especially gay men in the government who were seen as uh, easy targets for blackmail. And even though investigations into gay men in the public sphere, in the government sphere, uh, none of them were found to be guilty of working for the Russians or selling secrets to the communists. Several hundred gay men were fired from their jobs as security risks, basically. Now, we also see the rise of a group that's been around since the 1930s, the House Un-American Activities Committee, or HUAC, as it's better known. Um, HUAC also focused on Hollywood, which was seen as sort of a hotbed of communism. Several witnesses did come forward to claim that Hollywood was full of communists, while other witnesses called up before HUAC basically said, this entire thing is ridiculous, I'm not going to testify, uh, and people who stuck to their guns that way uh, could even face jail because uh, you have to talk to Congress if they order you to talk, and when these guys didn't, they were held in contempt of Congress, and that is a jailable offense. Uh, after that, even after they got out of jail, too, they couldn't find a job. They were what's called blacklisted, which means that um, when they went looking for jobs, they couldn't find many. So here is Walt Disney. He was a friendly. Uh, he uh, came up and spoke about how, yes, uh, Hollywood is full of communists. Uh, so did, uh, oh gosh, who else was on there? Uh, Ronald Reagan, who was the head of the Screen Actors Guild at the time, said, yes, there's a very serious communist problem in America. 
uh, and in Hollywood. Uh, then there's also the Hollywood Ten, and that's a term, by the way. That's why it's underlined. Uh, the Hollywood Ten were a group of ten screenwriters and producers uh, that were called to testify in front of HUAC and refused to name names when told to. Uh, many of them were imprisoned, and even after that, they were blacklisted. Probably most famously is uh, Dalton Trumbo. Trumbo is most famous for writing uh, movies like Roman Holiday and Spartacus uh, and many other famous uh uh, movies, and uh, he basically had to write under a false name in order to get his movies published throughout much of the 1950s and 1960s. Now, for people who were not Hollywood bigwigs, it was even more dangerous. A series of trials looked into communist spies, uh, and this led to even more anti-communist fear. Now, this also does show that there were some communist spies in America at the time. So, for instance, the editor of Time magazine, one of the editors, a guy named Whitaker Chambers, said that he had been part of a Soviet spy ring in the 1930s, and he named names of the people who were in his spy ring, including a guy named Alger Hiss. Alger Hiss was a high-ranking State Department official. Now, uh, Huac could not find Hiss guilty of spying. Instead, Hill, uh, Hiss was found guilty of lying under oath, what is called perjury, and got five years in jail. I think he spent three years in jail overall. Uh, the Alger Hiss trial made a, a star out of a young uh, congressman from California named Richard Nixon. Uh, this would be his stepping stone into the vice presidency, and later on he became president in 1968. That would be Richard Nixon. So here's Alger Hiss, uh, alive from 1904 to 1996. He was a lawyer and a State Department employee during the Roosevelt era. Uh, he was found not guilty of spying, like I said, but ended up lying uh, under oath and was convicted for that. He spent three years in jail. Uh, later on, uh, CIA intelligence that was decrypted, Russian decryptions, actually did indicate that he was, in fact, a Soviet spy. But this came out after, I believe, even his death. And he denied it till the end of his life. Uh, he did, however, say that three years in prison is a good corrective for three years at Harvard. Now... Even more sensational and with a stronger outcome was the trial of Julius and Ethel Rosenbergs. They were part of a spy ring that was at Los Alamos where the, uh, the nuclear weapons were being created back in the 1940s. The Rosenbergs were accused of selling nuclear secrets to the Russians during World War II. Part of their defense was that we were allies at the time, so it didn't seem so bad. The evidence against Julius was around. Later decryptions proved that he might have been a spy, actually, again. But uh, his wife seemed to be not uh, very involved in the spy ring whatsoever. Um, more surprisingly, however, was that uh, their accuser was Ethel's brother, David Greenglass. Her original name was Ethel Greenglass before she married Julius Rosenberg. Uh, many people at the time felt that Julia, uh, that Ethel was basically being used as a way to, like, you know, get Julius to confess. If, if Julius confesses, his wife gets off. Um, however, both pled not guilty, uh, and despite the rather circumstantial evidence that was around, at least at the time, the Rosenbergs were found guilty of spying, and uh, it was considered such an egregious act because it gave the uh, Soviet Union uh, the atomic bomb uh, that both of them were sentenced to death in the electric chair. So here are Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. Uh, they were part of the spy ring at Los Alamos, although it's debatable how much they were part of the spy ring and whether or not they were the inner ring or whether there were some more people more involved that got off because they testified against the Rosenbergs. Um, both of them, however, did uh, die being executed in the electric chair. Uh, they were also the only spies ever executed during peacetime. Now, this anti-communist crusade and what it created was called McCarthyism during this time. The name comes from one of the most well-known and powerful members of HUAC, a guy named Joe McCarthy. In 1950, uh, during a speech uh, for Lincoln Day at, in a place called Wheeling in West Virginia, Joe McCarthy gave a famous speech where he held up a piece of paper and kind of waved it around, and he said that, I have here a list of uh, uh, 205 communists that are in the State Department right now. Now, part of this is he never really showed that list to anybody, and uh, he kept changing the number of communists that were on that list. Um, however, 
the charges really got people scared. And um, there was a lot of paranoia. We don't know who's a communist and who isn't. Um, and a lot of people believe that there was just a communist plot to infiltrate American politics and they were, you know, right next door. They were living in your house. Uh, and you never know who's going to be a communist. And so Joe McCarthy used his power on HUAC to threaten his enemies, to gain power, uh, to shut down the people that he disagreed with. Uh, he was very wildly popular among his supporters and hated by his enemies. He's a very divisive figure in the 1950s. So here is Joe McCarthy. He is alive from 1908 to 1957. Uh, he's from Wisconsin, where he was a judge, uh, later became a senator, uh, and during that time he was also the chair of the Senate Govern Government Operations Committee, basically the Senate branch of HUAC. Uh, he also served in the U.S. Marines during World War II, uh, though he was accused of falsifying or at least exaggerating his military record during that time. He said that he was involved in a lot of active combat, but there's not a lot of evidence that he was. Now, while he was in office, or while Truman was in office, many Republicans were like, yeah, go after Truman. It's great. Um, however, after Dwight D. Eisenhower was elected in 1952 and McCarthy was continuing with his uh, anti-communist crusade, a lot of people were like, don't you want to slow down now? And a lot of his support went away, um, especially after he even hinted that Eisenhower may not be anti-communist enough, at least. So here is our 34th president, Dwight David, better known as Ike Eisenhower. Uh, he president from 1953 to 1961, uh, from Kansas originally, before he joined the Army. He was the supreme commander of Allied forces in Europe during World War II and the former president of Columbia University after the war as well. Uh, in office, he had a bit of bad health. He survived at least one heart attack, possibly two? I can't remember. Uh, he also suffered a stroke while in office. Uh, from this, his doctors recommended he take up golf, uh, and he was an avid golfer. He actually put a putting green in the White House lawn. Now, the problem was there are very few people willing to stand up to McCarthy, because if you tried to stand up to him, he could just say that you're a communist, and you could lose your job, your livelihood, your friends, your wife, your supporters, whatever. Um... One of the people who did stand up to him was the only female senator at that time, Margaret Chase Smith of Maine. Uh, she gave a speech where she kind of called out what was happening without naming names. She basically campaigned uh, or condemned the campaign of hate and character assassination in the Senate. We also see that some journalists and other people were uh, standing up to McCarthy, uh, showing him, showing footage of him sort of going after his targets, uh, showing that he was going after them without much evidence of any wrongdoing. Uh, most famous was probably the uh, newsman Edward R. Murrow, who went after McCarthy in his news show called See It Now. Um, if you're looking for a really interesting movie um, about this, it's there's one out there called Good Night and Good Luck, which is a very cool movie about Murrow and See It Now going after McCarthy during this time. Eventually, McCarthy's biggest enemy was himself. Uh, he went after the wrong people, basically. He went after the army, and he said the army was full of communists. In response, the army went after him. Uh, they said that he got special treatment for some of his friends, uh, making sure they weren't drafted for service in Korea. And this led to uh, Joe McCarthy being put on trial on TV in front of the world uh, in what are called the Army McCarthy hearings. And they were broadcast live in front of uh, the TV audience. And they showed McCarthy uh, being a bully, being humorless, uh, being generally unlikable, and as time went on, getting more and more drunk on TV, too. Eventually, the head lawyer, Joseph Welch, for the U.S. Army, uh, just stopped McCarthy, who was mid, you know, he was in mid-speech, basically, and Joseph Welch stopped him and said, you know, have you no decency, sir? At long last, have you no sense of decency left? And it basically shamed McCarthy into silence. Uh, Welch at that point said, I'm not going to call any more witnesses. We're done here. Uh, and that basically ended Joe McCarthy's time in power. Uh, he was later censured, condemned by the Senate. 
Uh, he spent the rest of his time as a sort of backbencher in the U.S. Senate, uh, died of alcoholism, people think, in 1957. Um, and, but McCarthyism as a term continues. Uh, you know, and he sort of, any sort of thing where like people are being accused of crimes without evidence and bullied into confessions, we still refer to as McCarthyism. However, interestingly, McCarthy still does have his defenders. Uh, some people point to, you know, Whitaker Chambers and Alger Hiss and the Rosenbergs and say they didn't get it all wrong. So here's Joe McCarthy and Joseph Welch. Welch is the guy on the left looking like he would prefer to be almost anywhere else in the world right now. Uh, and uh, he is being lectured by McCarthy. Now, anti-communist fear and paranoia was not just at the national level, it was also at the local level. We see a lot of HUAC-ish groups at the state level investigating the threat of communism. Um, we also see that people who had public jobs, like school teachers and pharmacists, were being forced to sign loyalty oaths. Um, people who had been found to be communists could lose their jobs, or uh, they couldn't get things like driver's licenses, which could be pretty important if you just lost your job. We see that private groups also search for communists, and uh, they looked for former members of the party, and um, they even looked for people who just sort of looked like communists, like people who had more left-leaning views. Um, or even if, like, you supported communists during the Spanish Civil War back in the 1930s, you could be accused of being a communist. It could be anything. Um, we also see that there is a move to ban books during this time that are considered dangerous. Uh, so, for instance, uh, the book Robin Hood was banned because he robbed from the rich and gave to the poor, and people said, like, that sounds a little communist. So here is a uh, political cartoon from the time, this uh, guy yelling fire, uh, and he's about to douse the Statue of Liberty's light, and he is dubbed hysteria. Um, this cartoon is created, by the, by the way, by one of the most popular political cartoonists of the 1950s, Herbert Block, who usually signed his name, as you can see down in the bottom left there, just Her Block. So Her Block also is the guy who created the political cartoon that had the first use of the term McCarthyism in it. Now, as we saw with both Rosenbergs and Whitaker Chambers and Alger Hiss, there were communist spies. Uh, however, most people brought up in front of HUAC uh, or who lost their jobs or were sent to prison were not guilty of anything more than holding unpopular beliefs. Uh, and this was the big issue is that, you know, you, they didn't have to find you guilty of anything. They just had to go up and, you know, say that you're un-American and that could be enough for you to lose your job. Anti-communism was especially strong among Im uh, uh, immigrants from communist countries. They were like, yeah, we really don't like communism because communism took over our home country of Poland. Uh, also, Catholics were very anti-communist because communism really had it in for religion, too. The FBI used the threat of communism to gather files on thousands of Americans, especially political dissenters, uh, gays and lesbians, people who did not fit into the regular social spectrum of America. Uh, and a lot of them were people who had no connection to communism. It was just that they were different or that they were liberal, and that was enough to sort of, you know, peg them as communist adjacent. Anti-communism was also used as a way to attack the New Deal during this time. Uh, many Democrats, including John F. and Bobby Kennedy, used anti-communism as a way of protecting themselves against accusations of being un-American as they ran for office. Uh, many groups used communism as a way to go after their own political enemies. So uh, some people who didn't like labor unions said labor unions are communists. People who didn't like the civil rights movement said that civil rights activists were communists. Uh, and people who didn't like people with alternative lifestyles said that they were communist as well. So it was a great way to go after the people you didn't like. So here, by the way, is Bobby Kennedy uh, and Joe McCarthy. Bobby Kennedy worked for Joe McCarthy for about six months after he graduated law school. Now, anti-communism could also be used as a political weapon as well. Uh, so we see that the Republicans, uh, when they didn't win the White House in 48, they used the threat of communist ac accusations against uh, people in the Truman administration. That's kind of what HUAC was doing. Uh, Truman vetoed an act in 1950 that said that subversive groups had to register with the U.S. government uh, and that also the U.S. government could deny passports to the people who were considered subversive and even deport them. Uh, he banned it, but that veto was overturned.
And much of Truman's fair deal goals were, in, uh, in the end, unsuccessful because basically we moved from f focusing on, you know, poverty and progressivism uh, and the civil rights movement, and instead we were looking at uh, communism instead. Now, the civil rights movement is also impacted by the anti-communist crusades. So at first, groups like the NAACP and Urban League were asking why communism wasn't being labeled as, uh, or why communism was being labeled as un-American, however, racism was not. Uh, however, in the end, even groups like the NAACP and Urban League eventually had to sort of uh, get any sort of communists or fellow travelers out of their organizations. We also see interracial gatherings were used as evidence of communist disloyalty during this time. We also see some prominent black activists like the poet Langston Hughes and the actor and singer Paul Robeson, who's also a lawyer, uh, were put in front of HUAC. There's great testimony where James Earl Jones is reading Paul Robeson's uh, HUAC testimony, and it's very interesting to listen to. In the late 1940s and early 50s, uh, the threat of communism, either real or perceived, basically replaced attempts at civil rights, uh, both by Truman and by civil rights groups. Uh, and we're going to see that this Red Scare really helped to delay the civil rights movement until the late 50s, early 60s.